Okay, welcome everybody to today's University of Texas Energy Institute's Energy Symposium for September 20th. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I will point out uh, the speakers coming up the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, we'll have a talk on nuclear reactors from uh, Derek Haas and Kevin Clarno here at the University of Texas at Austin. And after that, uh, two weeks from now, October 4th, we'll have a talk from Gregor Semenyuk. Uh, and he'll be talking about uh, stranded fossil fuel assets and the concept of mitigating climate change uh, and fossil fuel assets in the advanced economies. Uh, today, it is a very good pleasure to invite Nathan Hagens or Nate Hagens. Nate is the director of the Institute for the Study of Energy in Our Future, and his talk today is titled Constraints and Opportunities for Human Futures in a Systems Overview. And when he says that, he means it. And so we will have a barrage of viewpoints uh, that he has been studying for uh, over a couple of decades now. So he has had several roles and his, uh, he was formerly in the finance industry at Lehman Brothers and Solomon Brothers before he decided to pursue issues, understanding systemic issues in our economy and our environment. He was the managing editor of the website. It's called The Oil Drum from 2005, 2013. That was a very popular website for discussing energy issues. At the time, he's written a couple of books on these issues, including Reality Blind and one that's called The Bottlenecks, The 21st Century. He also has a podcast, a new podcast called The Great Simplification with Nate Higgins, and I recommend everyone to view his podcast. He has a master's degree in finance from the University of Chicago and a PhD in natural resources from the University of Vermont that he pursued after his uh, stint on Wall Street. So short abstract of what he's going to speak about today, systems are the core any basic understanding of the inner workings of our world and what are the parts of global systems and how do they interact and what keeps the system going. So today, Nate's gonna tell us how energy, ecology, economics, and human behavior all combine with a bunch of other global factors to create a particular whole, so, uh, whole systems view and picture of how our society is moving and the challenges we face in the coming decades. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and give it over to Nate. And we will take, uh, please submit questions as always, as we go. And this is going to be a barrage of information. So please uh, submit your questions as we go and we will address them and I will give them to Nate at the end. Uh, Nate, the floor is now yours. Thanks so much, Carrie. Uh, can you see my screen okay? I see it, it looks great, go ahead. Excellent, all right. So students and friends of Carrie King, I have a lot to cover here. In 45 minutes or so, we can make some choices. Um, I think the what to do, how to apply this to your own life, what does our culture need to do, um, is a separate presentation. Um, we often hear quotes from Albert Einstein. Here's one that we don't offer, often hear. If I only had one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and then five minutes finding the solution. So I'm going to spend 45 minutes today defining the problem, and maybe I could come back another time and talk about what this means for you as individuals and our culture uh, globally. So uh, we have rewarded reductionist expertise in our society. We have experts in all sorts of different domains. And what ends up happening then is we have people focused on single issues without flying up high enough to see the aerial view of how things fit together. We have islands of expertise separated by oceans of incoherence. We live as part of a system and the parts fit together and form a coherent story, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. There's a famous, famous cultural anthropologist called Marvin Harris, who had studied all these dozens of historical cultures. And what he found is each culture had something in common. They had a superstructure, which was the ideas and the beliefs and the stories of that culture. They had a social structure, which was the laws and the institutions and the economics. And underpinning it all was an infrastructure, which was the energy and material flows and waste flows. And he found that the infrastructure was the most important variable dictating the trajectory of societies. And as Professor King would tell you uh, in what he teaches in his class, energy is central to this infrastructure story. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today. So this is the human ecosystem 
simplified. We take energy and materials and combine them to create technology. We create monetary symbols to represent this, and we do this uh, uh, at a larger scale over time. This generates feelings that match the uh, emotional states of our ancestors plus waste. And we do this over time and the system grows. So I'm going to briefly talk about uh, how each of these things uh, interrelates. First of all, energy. So energy is the currency of life. Animals were the first investors. It takes an energy investment, an energy expense in nature in order to obtain an energy payoff. And the relationship between the payoff and the expense is what enables organisms and animals to reproduce, to survive, to pass on their genes, etc. So energy capture in nature uh, is central to how the web of life functions. Organisms and ecosystems self-organize to better access an energy gradient, as evidenced here as the number of leaves exposed uh, to the sunlight in a tree. Energy primacy represents how central energy is to past, present, and future human economies. No matter what good or service there is in our world that contributes to GDP, it required energy to invent, to create, to run, to maintain, to repair, to dispose of. Energy is central to all economic activities. And we're currently mining fossil energy. 10 million times faster than it was sequestered. And it's unbelievably powerful in what it does for us. A barrel of oil, which as of an hour ago is trading for $83 uh, a barrel, has 5.7 million British thermal units of energy, which translates into 1,700 kilowatt hours of work. If you translate that as uh, uh, an average human does 0.6 kilowatt hours of work per day, it works out to around four and a half years of human labor potential is supplanted by this barrel of condensed, refined, stored, liquid, ancient sunlight. So here shows me, I do the work on a good day of one-tenth of a horse. Here's my horse, Binga, who on a good day does the work of one horse. My little util utility vehicle does the work of 45 horses. And my truck with a little bit of diesel fuel can do the work of 300 horses. The next time you're flying across the sky, imagine 100,000 invisible horses pulling that jet across the sky because that's the power that is being used. So if we think about it, the, uh, the world uses 100 billion barrel of oil equivalents of the main fossil hydrocarbons and coal uh, every year, this works out to around 500 billion human labor equivalents are added to the global economy every year, relative to around 5 billion real human workers. So we don't think about this because we only pay for the cost of extraction. We don't, economics doesn't recognize this fundamental support of our economies. So what we've done, the story of industrialization is adding vast amounts of this unbelievably powerful, unbelievably cheap energy source to do things that humans used to do manually or with draft animals. And we did this at a very energy inefficient way. We wasted lots more energy than we used to, but that's because we could, because we had a lot of it and it was really cheap. What that ended up doing is making things economically more efficient, which means profitable. Um, so here's uh, an example. I live in Wisconsin. There's a lot of cow milking here. Historically, we used to manually milk cows. Shown on the left, one person takes 30 minutes to milk a cow, and the hourly wage is $5 an hour. Then there's an intermediate technology called uh, parlor milking, which uses 180 times more energy than hand milking, but the profits skyrocket up to $20 per hour, either the profits or the wages or the fact that the milk is cheaper for consumers. Then there's the fully automated machinery, which basically uses less time per human per cow, 
uses a lot more energy, 400 times more energy, and that even boosts the profits or wages to a higher level. But what ends up happening, and people in Germany are becoming acutely aware of this right now, is as energy prices increase, the really highly energy intensive activities become less profitable or actually operate at a loss. Look at the different colors here. Um, the blue is at five cents a kilowatt hour. And if we go from hand milking to parlor milking to automated milking, you see the profits that we just saw. As energy prices double to 10 cents, there's no difference on the left panel because we're not using any exogenous energy. The middle panel shows that our profits decline a little bit. And on the really high energy intensive process, our profits shrink dramatically. But what happens when energy prices triple? Again, nothing on the hand milking scenario. On the intermediate scenario, our profits drop more. But in the very high energy intensive activity, which would be like aluminum smelting or cement manufacturer or chemical processing or air travel, now this technology is now operating at a loss. So what we've done the last 150 years or so is we've added vast amounts of this um, one-time bonanza from the carbon pulse to our economies and to our expectations. This has boosted wages, it's boosted profits, it's reduced the price of goods, and it's massively boosted both the population and the goods and services per capita consumption of humans. Relative to the year 1500, the human economy, which is people times consumption, is a thousand times bigger. So economic theory doesn't incorporate all this. It just assumes that $1,000 worth of energy is worth $1,000 worth of cupcakes or iPhones or bike helmets or anything else. But the reality is, is that economics generally is energy blind. This is a common graph from an Economics 101 textbooks that there's this virtuous cycle between firms and households. Households demand a product, the firms deliver it, charge a little bit of a profit, and this whole thing is circular and continues. What this ignores is the source, which I just described most of this is fossil hydrocarbons, uh, which were drawing down way faster than Earth's battery was stored up. And we're ignoring the sink, which is the CO2 and other um, environmental aspects. So our economic system and our plans conflate the dollar value of what energy costs us with the work value of what it provides. And we don't include the cost of pollution at all. We are energy blind as a culture. So in effect, what we're doing is we're thinking that we have this annual interest that we're adding to our productivity in the world, but in reality, we're drawing down the principle. We are all alive sometime between the blue star and the red star during what might be referred to as the carbon pulse. So for now, oil, because it's liquid at room temperature, it's incredibly energy dense and versatile, Globally, oil is the economy. This is a logarithmic chart um, showing the relationship between oil consumption in an economy and the GDP of that economy. Now, there are a lot of stories of how much oil is out there and the relationship between technology and oil. We have the drill baby drill story, which says that the United States peaked in oil production in 1970 and then declined for 30 years. And then all of a sudden, technology overcame this depletion problem and we drilled our way out of a problem. Well, then the other story is that we take that same graph and break it out by geological province. The green is the lower conventional, uh, lower 48 states conventional high quality oil. On top of that, we added Alaskan North Slope oil, which is the same part of the United States, but it's a it's a non-contiguous geographic location. Then we started drilling under the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. All this stuff was declining. And then we went to the source rock, which is shale oil, light, tight oil, 
which is where all the other oil originated. This is the source rock. There's nothing left after this, and it depletes very rapidly. It's because of this accessing this um, source rock that we were able to pierce these new highs. So this oil depletes at up to 80% in the first 18 months. Shown here in the dark blue are all the wells in North America and in the United States that were drilled before 2015. And it shows their decline profile, how much of the original uh, oil is still coming out year by year. Then the orange is the wells drilled in 2015, the purple 2016, the blue, the yellow, the, the, the green, the red are wells that were drilled in 2020, and the brown is in 2021. As we have high graded in the past, every time we add new drilling, we have to run faster and faster just to maintain production. So if we were to stop drilling today in the United States for environmental reasons, for capital reasons, for unaffordable reasons, whatever, our oil production would decline 40% in the first year, another 25% the year after that, because all these prior wells are depleting very rapidly. If we talk about global oil production, it is my confident assertion that oil peaked in the world in November of 2018. This crash was due to COVID, but this underlying accelerated decline rate of around five and three quarter to 6% on legacy production requires a lot of capital upstream investment to offset. So I think global peak oil will probably be in the rear view mirror unless central banks or productivity come up with, with some miracle uh, in the near future. We talk about um, alternatives to energy, um, to oil, um, renewable energy. Uh, this is a whole 45 minute talk on its own, but let me just give a, a few points um, here. First of all, renewable energy is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, we need complicated uh, silicone clean rooms and steel and high temperature furnaces and all this stuff to create solar panels and wind turbines. And then in 25 years, we need to build them again. So the sun and the wind are renewable. The technology that we use to harness is rebuildable. It's no more renewable than a pickup truck. Second point is 80% of modern energy use is not electric. And most renewable energy is uh, produces electricity. Now, there are things that we can and will change uh, to electric, but some things can only be changed at a large cost and some things can't be changed at all. The other thing not taken into account is we have these 500 billion fossil workers that are start, starting to retire and it will be too costly to wake new ones. So all of our technological stories about renewables and other technology happen in an era where we were building our energy base higher and higher every year. And that may uh, no longer be the case in, in coming decades. The other point is that um, we have to not look at the marginal addition of some solar panels in Austin, Texas. We have to look at the full cost of the system. This is something that Germany and other European nations are learning the hard way. They have a, uh, a lot of renewable energy in, in Germany, but suddenly uh, optimizing for CO2 might not have made the most sense as optimizing for energy security. And the full cost, when including backup or intermittence or um, other reasons that the energy dense flick a switch uh, of fossil hydrocarbons are a, a superior um, energy quality in many ways, that this is going to have to be integrated. And lastly, especially if you care about climate change, which I hope you do, um, is that we are not removing uh, energy sources, that all this renewable is adding to the total demand. Emissions are not declining. Humans are now using more biomass, more wood than we did when we found fossil fuels to begin with. So, so far, renewables are just growing a bigger heat engine. They're not having us use less coal, oil, natural gas in total.
So the, the story of the energy future uh, is we've had increasing energy quality for the last two centuries. In the next century, we're going to have decreasing energy quality and increasing systems complexity. And this is the challenge that some of you as energy students at UT are going to have to um, uh, roll up your sleeves and, and play a role in that. Real quickly on materials, we talk a lot about energy. Here's a, a card from my Earth Day talk this year. I, I refer to it as the Trinity, which is that every single product in our world is a combination of three things. It's energy, technology, and materials. You could arguably add a fourth thing, which is dollars. So energy and GDP are 99% correlated historically. Materials and GDP are about 100% uh, correlated. So even if we use a different energy, uh, a low carbon or more sustainable energy source, we still need the metal, the steel, the plastics, and things like that. So there's this tight relationship there shown here between the orange line, which is global GDP, and the purple line, which is the global material footprint, which is a combination of energy and materials. Real briefly on technology, there are two types of technology. Type one is where we uh, find ways to use energy more efficiently or find new energy sources. Okay, so like making a power plant more efficient or inventing a new geothermal or finding a new oil field uh, under the Gulf of Mexico. These uh, extend our energy runway and allow us to use energy more efficiently. The other type of technology is we uh, use things like chainsaws and cars to do things that humans used to do manually, or we found new resource conversions, things that humans didn't have in the past. Um, the vast majority of technology in our world is of this type two. And so what ends up happening is we create these new products and these new draws on future energy demand and the whole system grows. So in fact, we have been becoming more energy efficient for two centuries. The energy intensity of each product of GDP requires less and less energy, a little bit less, like 1% less every year. So over time, we get better. However, shown on the colorful scale, our energy total scale continues to increase. So this is kind of what Kerry might have talked to you about as Jevons paradox, is as we become more profitable, as we get more efficient, we take those profits and we recycle them back into the economy in something else that requires energy. So our total scale grows. Briefly on money. Um, economic textbooks teach us that money is lent out from existing capital. The reality is, is that the vast majority of our money is created when commercial banks make a loan. It is lent into existence. As biophysical economic students, you should see the challenge with this, is that when new million dollars comes into the banking system, the banking system treats it as neutral. There's a liability and an asset. Everything is fine. But at that same moment, there's a million new dollars, which are a claim on coal or copper or water or trees. So the natural resource balance sheet has stayed the same and we've increased the amount of claims on it. So this is a problem when we run into economic challenges like we have since 2009, is that central banks are creating more and more claims on a finite amount of resources. So why do we do all this? What is the driver of the human system? We are de facto trying to replicate the same emotional states of our ancestors. We're not trying to go through our lives to have the most surviving offspring. That would be a fitness maximizer. Instead, we're trying to get the same neurotransmitters, hormones, endocrine feelings, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin of our successful ancestors in a novel world with lots of technology and media and smorgasbords of uh, tacos and uh, pizza and beer and whatever. 
we are adaptation executors trying to execute the successful adaptations of our ancestors. And this has major implications for our behavior. Many of you are college students. You like to play Overwatch or Fortnite or something like that. And you're sitting on your couch in your parents' basement and you won a game of Fortnite and you feel amazing. Your brain thinks that you just bagged an antelope and brought it back to your tribe. But the reality is, is you're accessing a coal-fired server and the pizza delivery guy is at the door. Our brains trick us into feeling uh, that this supernormal stimuli that is abundantly available in our lives is healthy for us. Um, also, the virtual worlds in our minds heavily overlapped with the physical worlds of our ancestral environment. But today we can imagine many more sentences, many more word combinations than can exist in our physical reality. So a lot of things on the internet sound plausible, but are actually disconnected from physical reality, which is why I'm very happy you're taking a class from Professor King, who's teaching you about some of the fundamental aspects of this biophysical reality. The virtual and physical worlds have decoupled in our modern culture where we can hear things about self-perpetuating energy machines or we're going to science the shit out of it on Mars and develop sustainable colonies, et cetera. These are disconnected from the science and physical realities that we face. Another aspect of our ancestral wiring is as biological organisms, we care about the present and the near term more than we care about the future. So things that are highly socially relevant um, about status with men and women of your age group or beer or fast cars or hamburgers, these are much more salient and shout louder to your brain than things of real significance to our lives like climate change and oil depletion and biodiversity loss. We are biological organisms, and therefore we compete for status. Status in our current world is linked to conspicuous uh, consumption and displays of wealth. It doesn't always have to be that way, but we care about relative fitness more than absolute. Shown here is a picture of Tiger Woods' yacht pulling into a marina where his ex-wife's boyfriend's yacht is longer than his yacht. So do you think that Tiger, a billionaire, is happy at that moment? So we care about relative comparisons. As, a, as shown here, we care about how we measure up to other people in our society. And what ends up happening is we're sending a signal to the rest of the world, not only us, but uh, the developed world is sending signals that this is the way we're supposed to live, this materially intensive uh, lifestyle. We are incredibly groupish and tribal. Tribalism is destiny and humanity is optional. We evolved from small bands of hunter-gatherers on the savanna of Africa, which is why we're so uh, prone to identity, tribal, group behavior, whether it's UT uh, um, Longhorns versus Oklahoma football, or whether it's um, climate change is a hoax versus climate change is an existential risk, we find groups and we identify with them. Finally, humans are not solitary animals like a leopard. We are incredibly social. Our behaviors are very adaptable um, because we like to mirror others. We, we conform to groups. So cultural evolution can happen at lightning speed versus biological evolution. So as college students, you probably are well aware of the many deleterious impacts our economic system is having on nature, including but not limited to plastics, ocean acidification, climate change, biodiversity loss, etc. I won't spend time on those uh, here, but it's something that I find uh, um, motivates me to do this work because I would like to um, have a uh, species and ecosystems make it through the 21st century who don't have a voice in what's happening in, in human systems. So if you consider all this, how the human ecosystem fits together, we do this all, and our culture keeps score of this versus something called GDP. 
gross domestic product. Or if you aggregate all the countries in the world, we keep score of gross world product. So GWP could effectively be called GWB, where the B stands for burning, because every single good in the global economic system started its creation somewhere with a small fire. GDP is not a great measure of our well-being or the health of our culture per se, but it is a pretty good measure of how much energy we burn because of the tight linkage between energy and GDP. So if we think about how all this stuff fits together, um, Carrie King, your professor, wrote a book called The Economic Superorganism. This is an aerial view of Los Angeles where the brake lights and the headlights if this was a video, would be very reminiscent of arteries and veins in your body. The super, the super organism is fed by a global transportation where diesel and, and gasoline act as the hemoglobin. Viewed this way, the super organism in our global human economy is always awake and always hungry, um, trying to transport uh, good services and people around the world. Um, and this is the emergent effect of 7.9 billion people following their self-interest to maximize profits. Profits are linked to energy. Energy is linked to fossil energy. And what has happened is we have um, effectively become a energy dissipating structure that uh, I call an amoeba or a superorganism. And what this organism does is it blindly seeks out um, energy to keep going. And from this standpoint, um, here are some emergent results of this. There's something in nature called Kleber's law, which says that the metabolism of an organism, and this scales from mice to whales, is the energy use of that organism scales to the three-quarter power of its size. Well, if you take all human countries and their GDP and you aggregate them, the relationship also holds to humans is that our energy use scales to the three quarter size of our GDP. So the implications of this is that this is not the fault of billionaires. This is not the fault of politicians. In fact, billionaires and politicians are in thrall to the market. We have outsourced our decision-making capability to the market system, and no one is in control. There is no one driving this bus. From a climate change standpoint, you can see the uh, the chart here uh, has not responded to the 20 uh, uh, international IPCC conferences that we've had uh, and continues to march relentlessly higher. So um, considering that growth requires energy, expecting uh, politicians to advocate and successfully keep fossil carbon in the ground, expecting that to succeed is like arguing with a forest fire. There's a metabolism and a momentum here. So briefly on energy and well-being, some good news. This is Vaclav Smil's chart showing the energy supply on the bottom axis and the human development index on the left axis. And after around 100 gigajoules per capita, the well-being, uh, the human development index levels off. And so the United States uses almost triple the energy as Italy, but at least before this recent uh, crisis, about the same level of human development. So the same thing applies in your individual lives. The the average American uh, consumes 100 100 watt light bulbs per year, uh, I mean, per day, constantly turned on. We use around 10,000 watts per person. The first few of those light bulbs could charge a cell phone or a laptop or chill your food to keep it uh, from spoiling. And so we get massive benefits from the first amounts of energy we use. And by the time we get to the 100th light bulb, we're really uh, at the margin of what it provides for us. So summarizing all this, our historic trajectory is one of humans accessing the hydrologic solar flows of trees, sunlight, soil, 
And a few hundred years ago, we reached the maximum scale that would be provided by that sort of uh, renewable existence. Then we puzzled out how to vertically farm under the ground to access coal, oil, natural gas, copper, other things. These things eventually form a Gaussian curve where we get the best first and then we scale it and we get more. But it's a normal distribution that they're finite. And this is a different sort of curve that humanity has accessed. This is the carbon pulse that I mentioned earlier. Then we overlay this, our monetary representations of reality, which is a black curve, which really can grow uh, based on how many electrons central banks and commercial banks create. So if you put this all together with access to this incredibly energy dense substance, our system grew so fast and so large that ancient or not ancient, but uh, pre-modern economists um, had land and land productivity as explaining our wealth. But we grew so fast that this no longer made sense. So uh, in the in the last hundred years, we replaced that with capital and labor as the defining uh, articulations of why we're so wealthy and energy was kind of discarded. So now we're using credit to pull resource consumption forward in time. If we run into an economic challenge, central banks print money, the government does stimulus checks. And what this does is it moves us up the black line, but we still have the same uh, red line. We're just maybe smushing it a little bit towards the present. So our society now views the world through a financial lens. We've not only financialized the human experience, but also the explanation of it. All key decision makers in our world, all governments, all corporations are expecting growth to continue, the black line to continue. And there is no credible institution or government body or corporation globally that is specifically planning for an end to growth. But growth is really an anomaly in human history. We are all alive during a unique exponential growth period in the red box shown here. And that is when economic theory was invented and expanded, by the way. But if you just look at even the last 2000 years, there were many, many centuries of flat to declining economic growth. But on the backs of fossil hydrocarbons, we've been on this moonshot trajectory. But our growth peaked 50 years ago. That doesn't mean we stopped growing. We're still growing every year. But the growth rate peaked 50 years ago in the early 1970s, which it so happens is exactly when our oil production growth peaked. So we have declining uh, increases in productivity. And at some point, our technology will not be able to offset the reduction or the retiring of our fossil workers. In the meantime, what we're doing is we're papering over our problems with more and more credit while the energetic material basis of our currencies deplete. So we, when we had a $50 bill, we had a, a certain amount of energy in our bank account, and now we have a $100 bill, metaphorically, with a smaller amount of energy to support it. So we talk about renewables or stochastic tech, almost all, well, all of the main stories about how we can go to a low carbon net zero future, still plan for a growing economy. How can we have renewable energy and get rid of the fossil energy and we're going to have a growing economy? There are no analyses out there or no really credible, well-known ones that say renewables are the right answer. We're just answering the wrong question. How do we have a smaller economy and use these robust, viable technologies, solar, geothermal, wind, towards a lower scale? Because that is too threatening of a question to ask these high-level uh, um, analysts and institutions and, and governments. And I don't know what that level is. It's certainly smaller than it is today, but we need more people uh, uh, asking that question. So under this framing, of an economic superorganism, what is not likely to happen? Growing the economy and mitigating climate change in the sixth mass extinction. Growing the economy by replacing fossil fuels with renewables. 
culture en masse choosing to leave fossil carbon in the ground, governments embracing limits to growth before limits to growth are already upon us. Under this framing, what is likely to happen? We're likely to recognize how important energy is. And so we're going to have all kinds of fancy, gimmicky energy products that grow the gross energy while the net energy declines, which will have mean that over time we'll direct more of our energy pool towards the energy sector. Kerry has a great graph on this showing that from uh 14th century England, we had like 80% of our energy went to the energy sector. And that hit its trough in 1999, where only 5% of our energy, plus or minus, went to the energy sector, which meant 95% of our energy went to society. As our net energy declines, that 5% will go to 10%, will go to 15% or 18%. So a much larger percentage of our economies will go towards energy creation, refining, delivering, et cetera, which means that some things in society like NASCAR or Disneyland or healthcare or libraries or arts won't get the energy that we've become accustomed to. Uh, another thing is we will have massive monetary creation and financial market support ongoing by central banks and governments. We'll have uh, modern monetary theory things like that, in order to stabilize the economic system. We will probably, by definition, have to have basic income, loan jubilees, and support for more people as the economic pie stops growing and eventually shrinks. Um, we will have a rightward shift in politics, and you can see how this is already unfolding uh, in Europe as loss aversion and fear of uncertainty of change um, causes people to vote uh, in a more conservative fashion. We will probably have less as opposed to more global environmental regulations as uh, caring about the environment the way that I do, the way that many of you do, is perhaps a product of living in an era of massive economic and energy surplus. And as that declines, it won't be as much of a luxury, which is something I'm very concerned about. And I'm trying to pass the baton forward to the environmental movement in coming decades so that it doesn't shrivel up and, and, and go away. Basically, we're going to be pedal to the metal in our economic system until we hit a wall. So a framework for solutions. Um, I actually no longer like to use the word solutions. I prefer responses because I don't think there is a solution um, uh, presumes that it's a problem to be solved. I think what we face is a predicament and there are millions of possible responses at many different scales. How are we going to deal with this globally? What are the things to do nationally? One of the things I'm working on is is a potential tax on all non-renewable inputs and a removal of tax on humans. So 95% of our taxes right now are on corporations or people. If we remove those taxes and taxed copper and coal and natural gas, then two things would happen. We would conserve a lot more because these iPhones would be $3,000 or something. And we would innovate. Corporations and technologists would have the correct prices about depleting assets to better use renewable inputs into their products. And it would result in a smaller economy, though, which is why it hasn't happened so far and is very unpopular. We're going to have to have responses at the community level we have kind of outsourced our community in our own lives um, to the internet. We order stuff in these brown trucks. We have Netflix and chill. We order stuff on the internet. We don't need humans the way we used to, and we're going to need humans again. And lastly, as individuals, um, being less energy blind than our culture gives you kind of x-ray goggles to the future because you don't have to base your, um, your self-worth and your expectations on monetary markers. You can have uh, a plan to have real capital, which is natural capital, built capital, social capital, our relationships, human capital, our health and our knowledge, instead of 
bigger and bigger houses and lots of digits in the bank. And I think this is kind of starting to happen organically. Um, so we live as part of a system. The system does fit together. And I think to understand the importance of a system, of a bird's eye view, will help us make better decisions about the future. A future human economic system is going to have to use, eventually, less energy and materials. It's going to have to have different technology. And we're still going to try to get the same feelings of our ancestors, but maybe in a different way, and hopefully with less pollution. Some uh, concluding statements. Growth is probably soon over. And the first major challenge will be responding to the the financial recalibration that will accompany it. We do not actually face a resource shortage, but rather a longage of expectations. The average American uses 100 times more energy than our bodies need to survive. It's just what are our expectations for the future? Renewables, viable, robust, can give us a lot. They're the right answer to the wrong question. These biophysical realities that I'm describing to you today cannot be given to the chancellor of University of Texas, Austin, or the president or the CEO of a corporation because it's not in their game plan for how to deal with flat to declining growth. It's too threatening as of yet. We still have many pathways to benign and more sustainable futures. And I will close with this quote. Uh, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence can shift the entire system, which is why I wanted to help my friend Kerry King give this talk, because you young humans learning about energy and systems are able to create these islands of coherence towards better decisions in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, excellent, Nate. Thank you very much. Thanks for the shout out in the book. And Ilya Prizhajin did have an appointment here at the University of Texas. So I didn't know that. Way to end. Yes, he was part of the Center for Nonlinear Dynamics. So, um, so we do have a few questions here, and I will get get to them uh, for you here. So, uh, some of these you probably touched on, but we'll just emphasize, or you'll you'll be able to add to it. So, you had a lot of well, you had a lot of ideas and some charts. And the first question here is. You know, how do we quantify and take environmental effects into different measures so that we're not energy blind, I guess, as a society? You've talked to a lot of people. You mentioned what you can say or what we can't say, we think, to uh, leaders right now. And I think the first guest on your podcast was Dick Gephardt, a former majority leader in the Senate. So any thoughts on how you quantify or even further communicate uh, this kind of a message? Um. Well, Dick Gephardt, it's funny you bring him up because when I first met him, all he cared about was climate change. And then he started to listen to me over hundreds of conversations. And he really does understand energy and the whole system now. Uh, and one of the things we're working on is this concept of advanced policy, which is educating policymakers ahead of a crisis to see what sorts of things would make sense that are not politically possible now. But I think to the heart of your whoever asked that question is we first have to have a cultural conversation about what we care about. Do we care about the environment? Do we care enough about the environment, about other species, the 8 million plus species we share the planet with, the ecosystems for our children, our children's children, and the offspring of other uh, species to pay a price for that, to pay more for the things that we consume? Because so far, we really haven't. We don't add the, the externalities into our prices. If you did full environmental cost accounting and added all the prices of our externalities into our goods, there would not be a single industry on the planet that would be profitable. So where is the middle line uh, there? How, how much can we add correct pricing um, to have a smaller economy, but not a, a chaotic one? It's, it's a really good question. And I, I don't have easy answers to whoever asked them. Right, thanks for, the, thanks for that. So uh, another question here. 
uh, quoted a simple question. Uh, question's always simple, answer's complex per your, your story. What do you think? I think you kind of answered this maybe with your little pyramid there at the end uh, and predicament versus problem. But question is, what do you think about the word sustainability? Ah, so, yeah. I do not like the word sustainability. It's like peak oil and climate change and fractional reserve banking. It's kind of a burned term uh, societally. When you hear sustainability, you know, you kind of roll your eyes. To be truly sustainable would be draconic relative to our current size and scale and number of humans, number of consumption. So I prefer to phrase things as let's try to be more sustainable than we are today. And that is definitely possible. But truly sustainable, like can be extended for millennia or longer, um, would require a massively different system. And truly sustainable means also not impinging the rights and ecosystems of of other uh, species. Right now, humans, in addition to mining fossil sunlight, are appropriating around 40% of the net primary productivity from the sun on this earth. And we're one species out of 8 million. So I prefer the term more sustainable to sustainable. All right, great. Well, I'm gonna skip to this question at the end. It's maybe kind of related at least a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on world population possibly leveling off You know, at, at some point in the, I guess, foreseeable future and subsequent implications is good bad or indifferent or how do we think about that okay so right now in 2023 we will surpass 8 billion humans that uh believe it or not is around give or take 10 percent of all the members of homo sapiens that have ever lived in 300,000 years um so Paul Ehrlich in the 1970s was on Johnny Carson more than any other person and he often said uh, there is a place for billions of humans, uh, but it's spread out over time. When we talk about population, I would uh, caution and highlight that there we have two population problems. We have a population of people, and we have a population of refrigerators, airplanes, cars, uh, computers, and things like that that are very resource intensive. In that sense, um, an American baby extrapolating the past forward will have the resource uh, footprint of 15 Filipino babies. So there is a trade-off between consumption and population. To the, the question, personally, I actually expect we will hit 9 billion and even 10 billion humans before we decline, um, but we're going to have a lot more poverty. There will be a lot wider and deeper poverty, even at 8 billion people. Um, and I do expect that after 2040, 2050, um, we will have uh, quite a few people fewer at the end of this century. But I'm not barring a war or some exogenous event. I actually think the trend is for a higher population in, in coming decades. Right. Okay. Thanks. And, and by the way, Carrie, I know that I don't know who's on this call. I know that some of your yeah. students and yeah. I've taught a class the last eight years called Reality 101. And um, in, in respect to your students, I'm really not teaching them as if they're 18 and 19. I mean, today's talk and the questions I'm answering right now, you're, you're full, full peers. I'm, I'm not candy coating any of this. I'm just telling it the way I see it. Right, right. Well, this is a, yeah, this is a seminar course, so we have all kinds of people that that view this. Um, it's not a question. They're kind of getting onto your uh, the super organism idea, uh, or at least this idea out there. So, as you mentioned, my book has that title, but you were talking about it certainly before I wrote my book uh, and influenced the book. Um, if you want to know what to call your second book, uh, I have some ideas. I, I didn't. I didn't choose this. You know, you write the book. I'm and kidding. You know, I'm choose kidding. The I'm title. Kidding. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get to choose it, so I have to hide the title. <laughs> so hint it to the next publisher. But the um, here's the question. I'll, I'll just try to read it instead of rephrasing. There's two that are similar. Uh, if, as you said, it's not the primary responsibility of billionaires and politicians to sort of be in charge of the economy, or at least they're not. Uh, in charge of the economy, then how do we make energy a more significant talking point in society? Uh, what 
solutions do you have to rally people around these ideas of the super organism? And uh, the second question is, you know, nobody's driving the bus, as you said. Um, what's an effective way that the super organism stops growing? So, you know, it's communication. Yeah, okay. How important do we communicate? What do we emphasize? Uh, so How first of all, I, I never said that it wasn't the responsibility of billionaires and politicians. I said it's not their fault and that they're not in control. But I would argue that especially billionaires have an outsized responsibility because they have an outsized ability to impact things. Um, personally, I think there is only there's two possibilities. One is that we continue to grow either by adding more debt or by some incremental new technology, maybe blockchain or something that allows us to continue to grow uh, for another decade or not much longer than that. And then we have um, kind of the what I refer to as the great simplification. The other scenario is that we run out of cans to kick very quickly soon, and we have the great simplification in the next five or seven years. I, I think... Um, you know, your students are 20 years old, so we will double the size of our energy and our materials every 30 years or so. So if they have an 80-year life expectancy, according to economic models, the size and the scale of the human economy will be four times bigger by the time they're 80 years old. I do not think that is possible, uh, nor is it desirable. I don't think the next doubling will happen. Um, I think education about energy is, is very important. I think the next can to kick, and we found fossil fuels, we went to debt, we went to globalization, we went to central banks. I think we're running out of cans to kick. And the next one is in our minds, where we don't need all this energy and stuff to be happy. And we start having examples of living more lightly and certain people can't live more lightly because they're at the red line now. So there's going to have to be some sort of distribution aspect to this. But I think for many people watching this podcast, using 20 or 30% less energy, um, not to save the planet, uh, but to make your own lives more flexible and resilient uh, as things come down the pike in coming decades is probably a good thing. But if you really understand human behavior, you really understand steep discount rates and the focus on the present, you can foresee that humans en masse, our society is not going to change much before a crisis. So if you really understand that, you can make personal changes and simplify first and beat the rush before that happens, uh, and then act as kind of a, a, a pilot in your family, in your community, in your network, and uh, this wasn't really the question, but I'll just throw this out there. The best thing you can do is to find other like-minded people that share your philosophy, share your understanding of the world, and go through this together. We are all on this runaway train, and we're shoveling fuel into the engine. Just meet people that you like and on the dining car and do the best you can and try to play a role in, in the larger challenge. Right. Sort of... Um... I've been thinking, you've probably had conversations, so see if you have any insights. This is me asking a question of, you know, if we're in the 1970s, yeah, Paul Ehrlich is writing the population bomb and wondering what the future is going to be. And then, you know, we, in some sense, continue to grow by, uh, in some sense, changing the cans we kick, as you were saying. What would be an argument? Uh, what if, you know, someone comes up to you and said, hey, well, we, we changed and we dealt with things after the 1970s. And if we have constraints now in 2020, uh, we're going to change again and, and, and keep growing. Well, what, how, how would you think about that? that? That's what most people think, because right. it's, it's always happened before. Thomas Malthus didn't know about fossil hydrocarbons. Paul Ehrlich didn't understand debt and globalization. Um, so all of the technological promises that we have about the future have this um, energy blindness to look at that chart I showed that our entire energy has grown every single year with the exception of 2020, 2009, a couple of years in the 1970s and the 1930s. And what happens when that starts to decline? What will technology be able to do for us? It'll be able to do a lot, but it's not gonna be able to solve the growth problem that we're discussing. It is possible that we could find some new energy source, like a bicycle, 
bicycle is the most energy efficient invention ever invented by man. What is the societal wide technological equivalent of a bicycle today? I don't know. But most of what we're spending our investment and our dopamine and our looking forward to is how to colonize Mars or send Teslas to outer space. And I personally think we're headed for an Earth Trek future, not an outer space sort of uh, um, existence. And I base that logic on energy is the currency of life and net energy is what powers society. And our net energy is starting to decline and we're papering it over with, with credit. The way that I could be wrong is if we have some new invention that gooses our productivity and that extends the runway uh, longer. And I try to look for those things and I'm not seeing anything on the horizon at the moment, but it's certainly possible. Right. You anticipated this other question here is asking about, you know, blockchain or crypto. Does it just to turbocharge? The question is the super organism uh, you, you kind of mentioned, you think maybe it gives us a little more runway. Did, anything else to say on that? Um, well, a couple of things, uh, real quickly, um, cryptocurrency is a new technology and what it does is it, it eliminates the middleman, someone that used to be a mortgage broker, no longer needs, uh, has to a job because we can create smart projects with Ethereum without them, but we still need to build the house and we still need to have cars to get to the house. So there still is a material and energetic underpinning to the system. The second thing is that uh, at one point, cryptocurrencies were worth $3 trillion. Those were also potential claims on energy and resources. I personally think Bitcoin is 50% chance going to zero and 50% chance going to 500,000. But that is not a technological statement about being more sustainable. It's more of a statement that our governments of the world are going to create money to solve our problems. And there's going to have to be some asset that people gravitate towards. And it might be Bitcoin or something like that. So I don't see cryptocurrencies as being the answer to the resource constraints that I uh, proposed in this lecture. Right. Uh, here's, a, here's another question. Thanks, everyone, for all your questions. These are great. Um, you're talking about you know mental change, the new technology may be a mental equivalent of the bicycle or something. That's the context here. But are you optimistic about a cultural shift actually happening or being self-imposed, or is it going to take a uh, air quotes Thanos type event to force it upon us? And I have to admit, I don't know the Thanos type event. Um, I am optimistic, but perhaps for a reason that might surprise you. Um, I've, like you mentioned in my intro, I've been working on these things for 20 years. So I've reduced my uh, baseline expectations of the future. So I'm quite hopeful that what will happen in the future will be better than what I expect. And I think for all of us, um, it's very easy to think of uh, Elon Musk, um, technology will solve it. We're going to all have robots and, and be wildly rich. That sounds enticing. Or we're going to have Mad Max and zombie apocalypse. That also sounds believable. Both of those beliefs obviate the need for any personal change or personal responsibility. And the likely path is somewhere in the middle. Um, so I, I could picture us in 2050 being 70% the size of today's global economy or thereabouts, and things are going to be chaotic. Some things will be beautiful. There will be some bizarrely awesome examples of human collaboration and altruism and sacrifice and invention, and some horrible uh, incidences of things that we will endure and experience. Um, but we have to recall that materially, we are the richest generation ever in the history of our culture. And even a 30% drop in GDP brings us back to the 1990s, which were not so terrible. A 50% drop brings us to the 1970s, which were also not that terrible. But it's, um, it's, the, it's like having a root canal appointment at the dentist next week. You're going to be happy when it's over, but thinking about it ahead of time uses up some of your mental bandwidth, which is why I stress the importance of finding other people that kind of understand this stuff and just talk about it. And talking about it reduces your cortisol and boosts your helper T cells, which help your immune system. Um, so I am uh, I am both hopeful and optimistic, but I'm also a realist. And 
I, the thing I'm most confident about is the human economy will not be bigger than it is today in 10 or 20 years. Right. Uh, it's a couple more, and then I guess we'll close it up here. So one um, saying there's, let's just say, roughly 8 billion people on the earth now. Uh, and there's, as the question imposing here, 4 billion or so who are trying to come out of energy poverty or don't have high consuming lifestyles. How do we expect them to, how do we explain the idea to them of an energy diet? Or is it mostly about us here and, you know, hanging out and well, there are definitely definitely different different messages. Uh, I did a podcast this morning with a woman from Djibouti who is um, active in climate justice. She pointed out that the vast majority of energy has been used by the global north, and it's the global south that has to deal with the floods and the droughts, and her farm animals can't uh, do well at night because of the the uh, temp ambient temperatures are are going up, et cetera. Um, I think it's a real uh, issue. Um, two things I will say there. Uh, one is we talk about rich countries and poor countries. And when we say that, we really mean energetically and material rich and poor countries, because some of the poor countries have much better social capital networks than we do. Um, the highest incidence of depression in the world is in inner cities, uh, uh, large cities in North America. Um, but yeah, there's going to have to be some, I mean, this is a big tenet of the degrowth movement is how, uh, can we contract and converge? And I, I don't have easy answers to it. I think it's going to be a really tough go, um, uh, in, in coming decades. Um, but I'm, you're right. I'm talking to your students, uh, who live in the United States and I would maybe have a different message if I was giving this in Indonesia or Bangladesh or something. It's 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 not an easy question. And plus, we didn't really talk about climate, but um, a lot of people in the Middle East will not have access to air conditioning in, in coming decades because of unaffordability or, or whatever, and temperatures are going to be increasing. Uh, don't end on that question, Carrie. <laughs> you want to end on that question? No, don't end on that oh, question. Don't end on that. Okay. Uh, well, here's one. I don't know. There's a new one that came in. because You might not want to end on this next one either. But um, this one's just kind of a question. About I, I'm, I'm just trying to describe reality. I really have no ideology here. Um, a lot of my friends are on the left. A lot of my friends are on the right. I care about animals the most of all, but I'm just trying to tell you my opinion uh, based on what the science says. I, I hope that people listening to this can play a role in these challenges, but I, I don't have prescriptions here, but go ahead and ask. Oh, right. Uh, I, I, will, I will quote you, I think, something you, you have said. You know, some of your best friends are human. So uh, <laughs> the uh, question here on the population of humans, again, and referencing Japan and Korea as roughly aging populations. So uh, the question here, do you think an aging population in general makes us more resource intensive? Or is there something special that you think about in terms of uh, aging population that might sort of naturally come along with a slowing grower, a uh, slower growing population and that levels out. Well, in nature, there's the grandmother effect and elephants, uh, matriarchs, grandmothers um, help uh, educate the, the young elephants. And maybe we could have the same sort of thing here because I found out that explaining this story to young people and old people were the people that could understand it. People in the middle um, had too much bosses and mortgage payments and the vortex of, of professional pressure uh, made it difficult. I think um, the problem with population, again, is I don't think there's a, any path to reduce our population because GDP requires more uh, diapers and toys and school teachers and everything. So if we have, this is Elon Musk's big thing, is that we have to avoid a population decline because it will hurt the economy. I think there's plenty of other things that are going to hurt the economy before that happens. Um, but I, uh, I haven't really thought much about the impact of the aging population other than I am one of them. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that is true. You need to have people, uh, historically anyways, you need to have people coming in, in their twenties to generate the economic surplus to take care of the older people. I don't know how that's all going to work out, Carrie. 
Yeah, I think your grandmother effect uh, concept there is pr pretty interesting. And I think you, you've had some podcasts, I think, about whales or, or, or something. I heard the killer whales and uh, they go through menstruation and the older females are the ones that teach the younger ones. So that's a interesting. We, thing. we have a lot to learn from nature. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We really will make this one the last question. Uh, it's because they're both the same. Uh, it's, if you mentioned Elon Musk a lot, so maybe they made people think about this, but it's uh, there's artificial intelligence and machine learning going to, you know, do anything significant for us one way or the other, uh, I guess, kind of an open question. Yeah, good question. So um, AI is the uh, cutting edge technology, and it could actually increase our productivity because we, in the same way that Uber, um, you know, changed the taxi cab model, we could apply that using code and machine learning to make things more efficient. I think from a resource standpoint, that will feed the superorganism. So we'll have more energy and resources from AI. Um, the other thing that I think AI will do is it will accelerate the Gini coefficient. We will have more wealth and income equality due to AI. For instance, DALI right now, you can go and, and give it a prompt, sustainable dolphin population, uh, Salvador DALI, and it'll come up with this amazing art uh, that describes what you wanted in two seconds. And so as that becomes popular and as we have that on our phones and our computers, real artists are not going to have as much opportunity to sell their beautiful art because the computer can do it in two seconds. Extrapolate that towards thousands of other applications. And it's it's a little bit of a, a, a mixed bag as far as how it helps society. So, But I did a podcast with Aza Raskin who uh, people should listen to that podcast because he describes what AI is, what it could do, but he's trying to apply AI to translate the languages of other animals like bonobos and whales and crows so that humans can extend our boundaries of empathy to other creatures because they all have languages. So AI it itself is a tool, but if I'm coming at you with a hammer it doesn't matter if I change the hammer to a sword, I'm coming at you. So that depends on what we do with the tool and the intention. And right now our intention globally is maximizing GDP. So I think AI could do some cool things, but there's also downsides. Right. As a Raskin is successful, we're going to have to rewrite all of these Gary Larson far side cartoons where he <laughs> what all the animals were saying in the little comment bubble. So. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for a great talk. I uh, enjoyed it a lot. I think the audience enjoyed it. So Nate Hagens, director of the Energy of the in Institute for the Study of 